Yes, hello. Um, to the lecture in statistics. Yes, what we want to do, we will start with a short revision. What is statistics about? And yeah, main principles and statistics. And then we will come to the specific content of this lecture. Yeah, if you want to reach me, the easiest way is just to write me an email and uh, then I will give you a feedback quite soon. What else? Well, there are many books in statistics, of course, and yeah, more or less you can take any statistic uh, books and especially we will do some um, time series analysis in this course and also some um, econometric stuff. So the first three books you see here is these books are just if I find my mice standard textbooks on statistics and the other three books uh, yeah they are they are a bit more advanced and you see it um, in the title modern econometrics so Verbeek is maybe one of the best standard literature if you want to know something about time series analysis and also applied econometrics from Asterio and Hall is also some standard literature and I find a quite good new book linear regression analysis theory and computing and here are also some links for um, in the internet where you of course find also much stuff on statistics this open intro statistics is just a standard literature ebook you can access via the web or statistical thinking in the 23rd century or if you want to study in harvard then you can just enter open courseware from the mit in boston in the united states and of course there you find also many um lectures on statistics and it is worth to have a look there and of course i want to animate you that you also have a look at the web and search the web for further material but anyhow um i will give my own lecture and therefore what we want to do is at first we start a short revision about random variables and a revision about descriptive statistics, parameters of a distribution, this is mean, this is variance and so on. And then we want uh, in a, let's say, first case study, talk about inequality metrics. Then we step into time series analysis. These guys who entered my course on macroeconomics then you know that um, in, time in economic time series analysis, it is quite important that you um, yeah, calculate the price effect in time series. And therefore, we want to talk about price adjustment in detail. And of course, we will do some um, forecasting techniques, moving average, exponential smoothing, average growth rate. This we have already done in my macro course. And then we come to simple linear regression. And if you remember something like the seasonal unemployment, that you have this pattern in the year that uh, during winter time, unemployment um, reaches a high and then comes back in spring and also um, afterwards in autumn. And there we want to um, yeah, manipulate this time series in doing a simple seasonal adjustment. And in the end of this lecture, we want not only do the simple linear regression, but also multiple linear regression. And for this, we want to know how good is in our model. This is then the so-called hypothesis testing. 
And then, of course, we want to talk about the three main problems you have in the case of multiple linear regression, and this is called the multicollinearity, uh, heteroscedasticity, and if you have autocorrelation, this just means that, um, yeah, you don't know if variable A causes variable B or if the direction is that variable B causes variable A. And that is the classical Han Eck problem at this point. And we want to talk about this in our lecture, of course, too. But then let's start with our general review. We are in the part of statistics and therefore, yeah, we want to talk about what is a random variable. A random variable is, in a theoretical way, just the mapping of our sample space. So sample space is, for example, how tall is a person. So if you take the length, what possible length of <coughs> a person do we have into the numbers of R? So we have the length in general, and then we map this into, let's say, 180 centimeters. And if we pick some person out of the sample, then picking this person is just the so-called elementary event. And that we, for example, pick some person where the random variable length equals, let's say, 180 centimeters. This has a certain probability. And this is then the probability distribution. So we have a mapping that probability pi is a function of our variable ai and it depends on what yeah kind of value has this variable a i and this is meant then here variable x equals x i okay so pi is the probability that a random variable x equals to some outcome x1. I think this you have already heard in your introductory um, statistic course. So then, what is uh, a random variable? Every possible event of a random experiment can express via a random variable. This is just this general mapping. And if you take a dice, then for, of course, your sample space is just that you roll your dice and the possibilities are one, two, three, four, five, six. And if you have rolled your dice, then maybe your dice show the five. And this is then the realization of your random variable. And then a really hard question. Hopefully you can answer this. If we have this, Sample space, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we have, yeah, um, uh, a dice and rolling it. What would be then the probability that the outcome is smaller than five? Maybe you can answer the need this. Sample space is one, two, three, four, five, six. What is the probability that the outcome is less than five? What do you have to do then? Well, of course, assume Every number occurs with 
the same probability. So if one has a probability of one six and two of one six, and of course every event is independent from each other, you have an idea. Well, every event has a probability of 1 over 6. And then we have to sum up E1 by 1 to 6, PI, and this is then P of x equals 1 plus p of x equals 2 plus p of x equals 3 plus p of x equals 4. 5 not anymore because we have to calculate the probability less than 5 and therefore 4 times 1 over 6 equals 2 over 3. Okay, in this case we had a discrete random variable, so we have a finite or countably infinite rea uh, realizations. Infinite countable realizations, this is for example the natural numbers. One, two, three and so on. But of course, and this you have done in your introductory course, is of course that it is possible that we have a continuous random variable and this would mean that our possible numbers are the real numbers and from this, from school, you know that we cannot count mm -hmm the real numbers and then we have to go from the discrete distribution to the density and this I show you here the difference between a discrete random variable and continuous random variables so this we had already done we have the probability that our random variable equals some specific numbers equals our probability that this event occurs. And then we have to go to our density function in the continuous case. So in the continuous case, what would be that, for example, x equals some specific number, let's say 5. Since we have a continuous variable in this case and we cannot count the real numbers, then in the limit the probability has to be zero and this can then be motivated but we won't uh, to go too much into detail at this um, um, part that we go then into the measure theory and therefore the prob probability of a continuous variable that this equals a specific number has to be zero. So in this case maybe you remember this let's for example 
recapitulate the so-called Gaussian distribution. But of course, we want to know some probabilities. Here in the example with the dice, we had it already, that here, smaller than 4, we had in our case, we just sum it up. This we had in our example. And if we go then to the continuous variable, then, of course, we have to go from our summation sign to integration. So, from summation to integration. And this would be then the probability that our event is less than our number x. And then, of course, we came to our aggregate variables, which uh, with which we want to um, describe our random distribution. And this is, of course, the expected value, the so-called first moment. And this is just the realization of our number itself times the probability in the discrete case and in the continuous case it is just the number times the density and integrated over our sample space in general this would be from minus infinity to plus infinity and then the variance the second moment this just means that we have the squared deviation from our realization with respect to our mean, our expected value, which we have calculated here. So this enters at this point. And of course, in the discrete um, case, we again have the summation over these squared deviations and in the continuous case, we have the integration over the squared deviation. Maybe you can give me a hint that you have already seen all this in your introductory course, hopefully. Maybe some feedback. Mm -hmm. But I think so. Okay. Then we have, uh, yeah, some rules of calculation. Oops. Uh, this is always happening here. That my. Beamer is going down if nobody sits inside, so I just have to wait for a second. You can give me a hint uh, that you have already uh, have you have still seen me and heard me. Okay, thank you very much. So calculating with expected value and variance. So. This first, or let's say this here, this just means expected value is just a linear operator. So if we transform our variable by just multiplying at our variable with a constant and adding a constant, then we can just put these two numbers out of our operator. So this a moves in front, 
and this may be moves just outside. But in opposite, if we take the variance, then of course, remember we have the a square deviation and if we add to our random variable a constant factor and every number is shifted by the same constant factor and we know that the expected value is also shifted by the same number, then of course this shouldn't change the variance of our random variable and therefore if we take here the equal sign that at this part here the b vanishes and we are going back to this slide we have the squared deviation so if you just put inside here a x plus b and if we want to get out the a out of the uh, brackets with the square then of course this moves out with a square too so if we multiply our random variable with some constant factor then the variance is multiplied with the square of this constant factor so this was just the short revision of what is a um, random variable, what is expected value, what is the variance. Then let's go to yeah, the main um, aggregate variables. When we want to do in a descriptive way to describe our random sample and for this we start with the general means and if we take these general means then we have more or less uh, we look at four numbers and this is the median the arithmetic mean this we already had also at the first moment because it, this is similar to our expected value geometric mean and harmonic mean so, what is the median? The median is if we have a random sample, more or less the middle of our observations. So, in this case, we have our numbers and then we put these numbers in a row from the smallest number up to the largest number and then we want to pick the middle of our sample and if our sample size n is odd then of course we have really one realization in our sample which is just in the middle and this is then the number in this row by n plus 1 over one half. If the number is even, then of course we have a, there a problem because there is no realization which is just in the middle. But then by convention we just say that we take the two realizations x n over 2 and x n over 2 plus 1 and we take just the arithmetic mean of these to realizations and define this as the median. Okay, I think this you also have already seen. Um, arithmetic mean, oh, this has to be down here. This, of course, uh, you know, this just means we sum up all our numbers and divide it by the sample size, the definition of our arithmetic mean and this arithmetic mean has some nice um, properties and the sir first is the so-called center of gravity. Why is it called the center of gravity? Well, if we take all our realizations and 
we take the distance, here have a look, not square distance, with respect to our arithmetic mean, that the sum of these distances and these distances can, of course, be plus or minus. If xi is larger or less than our arithmetic mean, that this is just zero if we sum all of this up and this we later on need when we do linear regression. Of course, we have the same property as um, in the expected value that also our arithmetic mean just transforms in a linear way. We have then more or less these invariants under linear transformation that the mean just transforms in the same way as the expected value a times x bar plus b. And at last, one also quite important um, property, since we quite often use when we are talking about deviations that uh, <coughs> the arithmetic mean has the property that the arithmet arithmetic mean is just this number which minimizes the squared sum of all distances between uh, with respect to a specific number. So if we take some other number differing from the arithmetic mean, the summation over all squared distances will be larger than the sum of all squared distances from the arithmetic mean. And these three properties will be shown in the exercises. Okay, but we have also some other means, and this is um, the so-called geometric mean. And if we have a look and compare the geometric mean with the arithmetic mean, then we have more or less plus plus times 1 over n. This would be the arithmetic mean. And what we then just do is we take just these 1 over n as an exponent and we interchange the plus with the multiplication sign. Nothing else more. Do you know when we need the geometric mean, especially in economics? If you have entered my macro course, then we have done it there, that especially geometric mean is applied if we want to know the average of growth rates for example. And then, and this will we uh, will need uh, when we are doing price adjustments, we have also the so-called harmonic mean. And also, this looks also quite the same as the arithmetic or the geometric mean. 
because if we write down this, this just means more or less that we have x1 to x uh, to the exponent minus 1, x2 minus 1 plus and so on xn minus 1 and this times n. And this would be 1 over n to the exponent minus 1. So this is then more or less the same as the arithmetic mean and we only oops put in here the exponent of minus 1. Well, when do we need this harmonic mean? Let's say driving from Wilhelmshaven to Oldenburg. How much kilometers? I think it's about roughly 30 kilometers with 100 kilometers per hour in one direction and you drive back with 50 kilometers in the other direction and you pose the question what is your velocity on average, then you have to apply the harmonic mean. This you can do also, find it out as homework. Okay, and also we will deal with um, all these general means in our exercises next time. So, what else will we have? Then, of course, these are our means, and then we want uh, to characterize um, a random sample. What is the, yeah, in a general way, what is the spread of our sample? Well, and the easiest way is just to look up all our realizations and then we pick the lowest number and we pick the highest number and we define this as the range. Of course, then you have, yeah, the problem that you have something like, um, yeah, outlayers. Let's say that we have a random sample with 1, 2, 1 1.5, 2, 1, and 1,000, then the range equals 1,000 minus 1 is 999. And then we can pose the question, is this a good characterization of the sample. So this would be then a, okay, no problem. This would be then um, a quite yeah, rough description of our sample. And therefore, we yeah, go then to the uh, so-called mean absolute de deviation. And this is something yeah, quite similar to our mean squared deviation. And there we take just the absolute value of our deviations and divide this by the
sample size. So, and now you can pose the question, um, why do we always take um, the square deviation and why we don't uh, take this absolute mean deviation? And yeah, there is uh, one a bit more philosophical interpretation, which is going back uh, to Gauss. This has to do with the central limit uh, theorem and uh, the so-called normal distribution, because the normal distribution, I already showed you here, the so-called Gaussian distribution. You hopefully have seen this in your introductory courses, <coughs> because this normal distribution can be described by the squared deviation, uh, the so-called variance. But there is also a practical reason why we do not take um, the mean absolute deviation, because maybe you know from school that the function f of x equals the absolute value of x has one property that it looks like this. And this means, in the origin, this function is not differentiable. So we cannot calculate the first derivative, or we can only calculate the first derivative on the left side and from the right side. And these two derivatives, they differ. One is minus 1, the other one is plus 1. And therefore, we have this kink here. And this would be then the case that the function is not different. And this is, yeah, a not not a nice uh, property if you have these kinks in your uh, function, especially if you want to optimize something, then you always want to just calculate the first derivative setting this to zero. And this would be also some practical reason. But on the other hand, if we go especially to financial data, then we sometimes the that a description via the mean absolute deviation fits a bit better our, what happens here? Oops, I don't know. So let's take this. So that um, a description of our random sample via the mean absolute deviation fits better the data than with the squared um, deviation from the mean. Uh, and this you always have to keep in mind if that you just do not take all the numbers or uh, the aggregate variables which anybody else would apply, but that you look at your random variables and you take the suitable numbers. So sometimes taking Financial data, M80 is better than squared deviation. So again, my beamer went off. Anyhow, I think the recording still works. Let's wait a minute. Is it coming back? Because I have to.
need uh, the second monitor that I know what is recorded. But then uh, we want to go to the variants which um, I already talked a lot about. And the descriptive variants is then just defined as the deviation from our arithmetic mean in general here divided by the sample size. But this is called the so-called biased variance. And if we want to calculate the so-called unbiased variance, then we have to divide by n minus 1 and not by n. And the reason is that the expected value of sigma hat squared equals sigma squared, and this would be true variance of the random variable. Because, of course, if you put your numbers out of your sample space, then you have some specific realizations. And then you can calculate something like these variants. And what you, in general, want to have is that you have an estimator for the true mean and the true variance of your sample. But if you don't have the full sample, so every realization, then of course you cannot be sure that you have calculated the right number. And in this case, you want to have the property that The expectation, the expected value of your number you have chosen equals the true number. And it can be shown that then you have to divide the mean squared deviations by n minus 1. And this we will show also in an exercise. N and exercise. So, I already talked about this, that, where do we have it? Here, that this is called the first moment. So more or less we can say here with exponent 1, nothing else changed. If we take the variance, we have here a 2. And then, of course, we also want to describe um, yeah, a bit more of our sample. And for this, we then take the so-called third and fourth moment. Oh, at first, let's go to the uh, <coughs> so-called standard deviation. The standard deviation is nothing else. If we take here the square, then, of course, we have other units. Take, for example, my... Um, um, Example in the beginning, if we take all the length of our people in class here, and uh, one has uh, one, uh, 170 centimeters, the second 180, the third 184, and we calculate the mean squared deviation, then of course these variance have has the unit not centimeters but centimeters squared, so we cannot compare this with our mean, 
<clears throat> length in our sample and therefore then we just take the square root of our variance in order to obtain the same unit as our mean. So taking this we have the same unit as the mean. And for this of course we can um, calculate the square root out of our biased variance and this is called the uncorrected standard deviation and if we take the square root of our unbiased we come to the corrected standard deviation but you have to keep in mind that we cannot say in general that the expected value of the corrected standard deviation is in general not equal to the true standard deviation. Okay, but now we come to our third and fourth fourth moment and this is then a descriptive parameter. You can suppose maybe some distribution which looks like this. So this is a distribution which is maybe skewed to the right or left if we have skewed distributions. And a skewed distribution, if we take only the first two moments, the mean and um, the variance, then we cannot describe this property that our distribution is maybe skewed to the right or to the left. And for this, we then calculate the so-called skewness. And here, the skewness is then the third moment, called the third moment because we take the exponent up to three here. And this is then normalized by the standard deviation. And then we can say, of course, if we have a negative skew, then the left tail of our distribution has to be longer. And the mass is concentrated on the right. So this would be then in this case. And here we have positive skew. And this would be that the tail of the right side would be longer and this is of course also quite often an interested, interesting property of our random sample and um, we will do some case study looking at income distribution and um, this you can maybe think of that if we take the income distribution of Germany then of course we have some very rich people but the center of mass of incomes is, of course, more concentrated in uh, <coughs> the lower parts of the incomes. So um, I think the mean income in uh, Germany is roughly about uh, 35,000 euros per year. And uh, to calculate this QNIS, we can then the uh, uh, we can then take this number of skewness. And then we have also the so-called fourth moment and there we take the exponent 4 and here we can roughly speak of the how strongly is our random, vari our, um, random sample peaked yeah. but there we have to be careful that uh, this is all not always um, the case that we let's say can say this is quite strongly peaked and this wouldn't be 
that strongly peak because we always have to calculate these peakness relative to the so-called normal distributions and therefore we have also to be careful with these statements that we are heavy tailed with many outliers or the other way around that um, if kappa is smaller than 3 because the 3 comes that photosis of the normal distribution equals 3. Therefore, we have this number um, 3 here. And um, in an exercise, we have. I will show you that we have also to be careful just um, interpreting a kurtosis larger than 3 as heavy tailed and smaller than 3 as flat topped. Here, be careful with this interpretation example in exercises. So, for the next time, then um, I want you to look, have a look into the exercise and give me a feedback if you want to enter in presence or via Zoom. Son, have a nice day. Oops.